Hello, everyone, and welcome to A Fresh Hell, laughing in the face of motherhood. This is Margaret. And this is Amy. And today we are going to talk about rules for making better decisions. Okay. As a parent and just in life, this is one of my, I love looking up these psychology, like ways we think and why we think things. So forgive me for dorking out and preparing this episode. I'm just along for the ride here. I mean, generally, I do like to take tests that are like, what kind of Muppet am I? Uh Um, Fozzie Bear, for the record. Uh, You know, what real housewife am I? I mean, I like I like tests and quizzes. These are like rules for the for the way things are and why the way things are. And some of them you're going to find out are not called rules. They're called razors. Um, mm. like Occam's razor, and maybe, which you may have heard of, and some other ones you probably have not heard of. I'm an Occam's razor fan. Okay. I like an Occam's right. razor. So the reason they're called razors is simply because they they pair things away. These rules philosophers came up with over, some of them are ancient, and some of them are 10 years ago, somebody said this, but they're ways to make better decisions by allowing you to pair certain things away, certain categories of things. You don't have to consider this. You don't have to consider that. You don't have to consider every single possibility when the doorbell rings of, of who it is. You can just think of who it would probably be. And that's how you make a better decision about whether or not you want to answer the door right now. It saves There's us a time. Famous saying in medicine, when you hear hoof beats, don't think zebras. Think that, of like, horses, horses, not zebras. That's horses. Right. Yeah, I and, put this in my uh, book. Actually, it's it's it. Yeah, and and it's it's that you should think of the thing hoof beats. It could be a zebra, but it's probably a horse. And so, don't go looking for a zebra if there's a horse standing outside your window. It was probably a horse. Yeah, and I think I think that in the post, I'm going to posit. I have mm-hmm. no uh, evidence for this at all, and have done no research on the subject. But I'm still going to posit that in the post internet age, this phenomenon has gotten exacerbated. And that I think our national dialogue and our internal dialogue tends to be this bump on my cheek is probably the flesh-eating bacteria that I read about on Reddit. And the reason why gas prices are high is because of the giant conspiracy that exists on eight different continents versus I mean, people have always had a tendency to that, but I do think the internet certainly hasn't helped. Like yes. the availability of vast amounts of information definitely takes us to zebras much faster, I think. Yes, yes, exactly. But you don't always have to consider every zebra and every hoofed animal. Sometimes you can just assume it's a horse. Yes. So we're going we're gonna to make this easier for you. And we're going to make it easier for you to... Um, Talk to the next crazy person that you encounter who wants to tell oh. you that zebras are coming. Yeah. What if I am the next crazy person <laughs> I encounter? <laughs> then what, Amy? So like the one of these that almost everybody has at least heard of, even if they're not sure what it is, is Occam's razor. And Occam, William of Occam was a medieval philosopher. He was around in 1300 and he had some crazy ideas. But this one is I really just want to take around. a moment, not that he cares, to say shout out to William of Occam. Mm-hmm. In the 13th century, you're basically so busy trying not to starve to death or die of a plague. And this guy's a philosopher. Like, yeah. good for him. Yeah. He's taking right. he time had... out of his day to think about stuff when, like, basically everyone is dying of everything. And he's like, let me ponder some let stuff. Me, come, let me ponder this. Yeah. Good yeah. job, William of Ockham. So his most, um, his, his, the idea that has lived through the generations, the way he put it was entities should not be multiplied beyond what is necessary. And the very simple way of putting it that we might put it is don't make things more complicated than they need to be. Would you like to give it to us in the original Latin, Amy? Entia non sunt multiplicanda praetor necessitatem. Entities should not be multiplied beyond what is necessary. Yeah, people said like keep it simple, but it's really a little bit more complicated than that. It's like don't consider more possible causes for an event than the thing that it probably is. Like, like... If I use this example uh, from my own life, if there were meatballs missing from the spaghetti bowl on your dining room table and your dog's paw prints are on the chair, it, it was probably not a, a burglar who broke in. It was probably your, your dog with tomato sauce on her, on, on, yes. on her fur. It was probably I, her. I always feel like I hear Occam's razor anecdotally 
that means when you take away all of the possibilities that are, I don't know, outside the norm, it's the thing that's remains, like in a mystery. What's the razor? Right. Slice away. away. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, Amy couldn't have done it because she was has an alibi, and Margaret couldn't have done it because she's way too nice to rob a bank. So it must have been this person who robbed the bank. Right. Like, that's the razor part of it. You pare away the hypotheticals and you stick to what is most probable. Like, um, you know, if if it's raining, if you can see raining your window and you hear thunder, it's it's thunder. It's not somebody making, you know, with a speaker outside playing a, a thunder sound loud enough for you to hear it. So you don't have to right. consider that it could be that. I'm, I'm the, the example, so then I was thinking, okay, how do we tell people to apply these to their lives? I think it, the example that you gave before about the, the bump on your cheek is probably a pimple and not flesh-eating bacteria. Don't right. assume hypotheticals beyond what is what is there. And does this apply to a life-changing philosophy presented to me by my husband? I don't know if this is Occam's razor, that don't assume ill intent that, oh like that's a coming. lot of oh, that's coming. So don't don't jump ahead okay because that i feel like has been very useful to me but i'm not going to skip ahead uh, well well you we, we could we're there we're there so okay. let's get there i believe you're you're um bringing to us hanlon's razor so oh, i was going to say david abel's razor because he's the one who told me this about is it hanlon's but razor he stole it from hanlon this guy robert j hanlon he he literally uh submitted it as like a reader, Murphy's Law, you've heard of the Murphy, I didn't even include Murphy's Law here. Murphy's Law is anything that can go wrong, will. It seems kind of more like a right. joke to me than anything else. And so there was a book of like, send in your other laws. And so Robert J. Hanlon, like 20 years ago, sent in like, here's my razor. And everybody said, oh, that's a good one. And it's become, it's become a, then now David Abels is talking about it at home. So Hamlin's and I will razor. Say, he quotes this exactly. Never attribute to bad intentions that which can be explained by other causes. He doesn't say that which can be because I'd be like, what the heck are you doing? But he always says never attribute to bad intentions anything that could be explained by something else. Right. This is a game changer for me. This has changed me vida loca, Amy. The original, I guess Hamlin started out saying don't attribute to bad intentions what could be explained by stupidity, but but people have sort of broadened that to make it more useful, which it, it's just not ill intent. It's carelessness. It's lack of information. Um, the example I came up with is that you, you didn't get invited to coffee after the preschool drop off, but that's because you were out of town last week when they talked about it. It isn't because everybody hates you and doesn't want to be your friend. It's oh, just, this it, is it, such a game yeah. changer. I mean, I always say the best advice I ever got, we did best advice episode. My ex said to me, you would be so much more relaxed if you realized how rarely anyone else ever thought about you. Yes. And I just, it just popped up on my TikTok or Reels or something, but there's an amazing scene in Mad Men. I can't remember any of the characters' name because I do a complete brain dump after every season of a sh every show I watch because my husband's always like, remember this and this? I'm like, no, I, I flushed. How do you like, do I don't remember that? I would love to do that. I wish I knew, but I mean, it's I would love like to get that. No, that the data minute it's back. over, like Game of Thrones, I watch every episode. Tell me, ask me anything about games. I'm like, I think someone was named Sansa. That's the only thing I remember. But like, boom, it's all gone. I can still come up with with Pinky Tuscadero as Fonzie's girlfriend <laughs> on Happy Days. Kind one hundred so thousand years ago. Skill sets, but yeah. there's some. It just came up, and there's a kind of good looking, like smaller guy in the ad agency. And he's in the elevator with Don Draper and he's mad at him for some reason, played by John Hamm. And he's like, I think you're this. I think you're this. I think you're this. And John Hamm just turns to him and says, I don't think about you at all. Mm. And it just is so like, boom. and he means it in a mean way. But this is my uh, Achilles heel. It is just a thing that I get very wrapped up in. And I know a lot of people who get wrapped up in. And sometimes when I hear it from other people, I'm like, okay, crazy. Literally no one thought of you. Right. It's not that 19 people are involved in a conspiracy to make sure that you don't hear about the volleyball game. Like mm -hmm. what? Like, no, this doesn't even involve you. But I think there must be something in our biology or our mental set points that makes us feel like we are the center of the universe and the center of the right, story. Right, right. And particularly kids. I think this is really useful for kids like 
your your child's brother spills water on the you know the drawing that he was working on for an hour and he's sobbing it's okay to be upset but your little brother didn't do it on purpose he didn't do it to be mean he did it because he was careless and he's saying he's sorry and he's upset too and and don't you know don't accuse him of doing it on purpose or help help your kid understand that ill intent was not really part of it and that unless you have proof that ill intent was involved, you shouldn't assume ill intent was involved. Yeah. And I mean, I live in a small town and we'll be driving, you know, on the way to whatever violin lesson and we'll see five kids who are friends with my kids together in town at the pizza shop, let's say. Immediately, they didn't invite me. They're hanging out without me. What's going on? Blah, blah, blah. And believe me, this goes for the moms as well. Mm -hmm. Likely they ran into each other at the lockers at the end of the day and someone said, I'm hungry. It's not that there's a vast conspiracy to leave you out of the pizza plan. And I think that this also in working environments, I find all the time that we have something going on, construction going on in the town, right? And people are constantly on Facebook like, what? idiot is overseeing this project that the stupid people who don't even know that construction should take a month and it should take, you know, now it's taking three months because people, idiotic people made this stupid plan. That's always, you know, how people talk about it. And finally, one of the town people came on the board and said, actually, we opened it up and there was like a rotten whatever inside as what happens in construction. And now we have to get the state involved to clear the site. Mm-hmm. You know, it's annoying. It's bureaucratic. But the way that people assume stupidity is. Uh, or assume ill so intent. Frustrating. Right. Yeah. Ill intent. Oh, yeah, that's right. They're all taking the money. They must have all mm-hmm, taken bribes. Mm-hmm. And that's why it's going on for so long. It's. Having worked in so many different kinds of organizations and seen so many different things, no one has the spare time to be conspiring. I'm telling you, they're just (laughs) trying to get the sidewalk built and they found something weird underneath it. Like, but I think people, uh, my brother, who's a lawyer, often says, if you you have to tell a jury everything, because anything you don't tell a jury, they will fill Uh. in for themselves. And so if you're like, if, if you, Amy, are the uh, victim of the crime and you come in with a bandage on your arm, totally unrelated to like the bank robbery that you're testifying against, you have to say, what happened to your arm? Oh, I was involved. I burnt it on the stove two nights ago. Because otherwise the jury is like, What's and she has a bandage right, on right. her arm. I'm going to make that fit the story. I, her cube Poirot, noticed I, the bandage. Right, right. It's like, no, I just burnt myself taking cookies out of the oven last night, and now I had to come to court today. But I think that this is such an interesting human quality. And for me, my husband's a very even-tempered person and just also super nice and gives everybody the benefit of the doubt. Sometimes I believe to his own detriment. Because sometimes I'm like, actually, that person is terrible. Right. But, well, and you should really know that. Mm-hmm. But I think in general, that's right, that this this need to fill in the gaps of like, what is the secret agenda of the people trying to build the sidewalk? Either they're idiots or they're on the dole or the, or they're taking bribes or whatever it is. It often works against you. This is, it occurs to me that I feel like airlines should understand Hanlon's razor and they should, as you say, fill in the blanks because, you know, when you're sitting on the airplane and you see the flight attendants sort of talking to each other and then the pilot comes out and they're sort of murmuring to each other. It's like, you hate us. You want me not to get to Chicago today. You're right. Plotting to keep us on this plane forever when they could just say, we're really sorry, uh, the person who has to sign the paperwork before we can leave is taking a phone call and it might be a couple of minutes because nobody can find her, but we're going to be on our way as soon as possible. We're really sorry. Instead, you just sort of wonder. And, and I find myself deciding that American Airlines is, is plotting to make sure I miss my connection. And I do think that this is super important with kids. The small examples that we've given of like the homework and people in town or whatever, but Kids are constantly doing this, constantly filling in the blanks that like our neighbors are getting divorced. And you may think like, well, it would never occur to my kids that we're going to get divorced because everything's going fine at home. Your kids are thinking that they're, they are constantly assigning meaning 
to things. And this is why it's good to talk about stuff out loud because you'd be surprised what your crazy old kids are thinking about (laughs) because they're filling in a lot of blanks. All right. We'll be back with even more rules for making better decisions. Okay. This one was new to me. Christopher Hitchens, who was a sort of, you know, bon vivant and thinker. He died maybe 10 years ago. Yeah, he was um, a very anti-God guy, as I remember. Anti-God, right. So his, he, had a, his... he wrote a book that was like, God isn't real, whatever. So this Hitchens razor came from, I guess, that book. And he was talking about God when he came up with this, with this truism, but uh, you can apply it very widely. Hitchens razor asserts that which is asserted without evidence may be dismissed without evidence. So in other words, the burden of proof of a claim is on the person making the claim, not on the other person to prove the disproof. Like, sure. if, like if I say to you, you robbed a bank this morning and you say, no, no, I didn't. I was recording with you. I'm like, well, prove it, prove it. It's not on you to prove you didn't rob a bank. It's on me to come up with evidence that you did rob a bank. I can't yes. just assert a claim and then make you disprove it. In fact, our whole jurisprudence system is based on this yes. idea, right? That like, you can accuse me of something, but then you have to prove it. My One of my kids is taking a criminalistics class, which is super fun and interesting. And we're talking a lot about burden of proof versus, um, you know, without a reasonable doubt versus preponderance of the evidence and like how it all works. And it is kind of fun to revisit. Like, oh, that's right. This is how it works. You have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that I did something. You can't and I can just say nothing at all in mm-hmm. response. And if you don't do your job, then I go free. And so because I didn't rob a bank, Amy. I was recording with you. I mean, I, I, it's true, guys. It's true. I would be your alibi in this case. Maybe that was an imperfect example. But think about like every crazy person you talk to at a dinner party who, who comes in with this like outrageous claim, right? That and, and that you're sort of like, that's not true. I'm like, oh, really? Well, then why do I think it is? That, that's, not, that's not sufficient. You have to come with proof or I don't have to entertain your claim at all. Again, Hitchens was saying, like, if you can't present me proof of God, then I don't have to engage with why you think there's God. OK. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, the downside of this is that the crazy person is going to be so excited when you say you have to prove it because they're going to be like, here are <laughs> nine different Reddit threads right. that prove it. And, and then you have to be like, that's not really proof. That's right. like that's just somebody shingle monster <laughs> one, two, six who says that. And that's not actually proof. Right. Uh, so I would say that Margaret's razor is just nod and say, oh, super interesting. And then find someone else to talk oh, to that's immediately. A good one. Because, man, that's when you razor. ask people to prove their assertions. But I don't know. I have reached a phase in my life, I find in general, where debate. I come from a very debatey family. Like every meal and everything growing up was like, well, I'll take the other side of that. And, you know. I guess I do have sort of a podcast where I debate you about parenting (laughs) issues, but in general, I just find that proving my point is so uninteresting to me, but more importantly, you proving your point to me is is my kryptonite, right? Like, I just don't want to listen. I'll read a book every once in a while, like on the podcast, we come up with ideas. That's really interesting. But someone wanting to prove something to me is um, my personal nightmare. And it's also like we agree that, oh, dinner time is hard. Here's how to plan it. Right. We're not coming from there is no, no such thing as dinner time. Why are you talking about that? Dinner time is a fiction. That would be pretty hard for us to have an agreement. Yeah. And I'm going to say that, like, as you know, at some point, a uh, phrase uh, always comes to me during the year that is my guiding phrase oh, yes. for the year. Have you given us a phrase for 2024? No, because I haven't landed on it yet. And it's a little bit late, but Mm -hmm. I'm starting to think that my phrase for 2024 is facts already submitted into evidence. That like, I give you, what can we agree on? You know, like what facts submitted into evidence means like, if you and I are in a dispute at trial where like you're, you want to start. Take, you want to take over the podcast and I want to take over the But we both want to fire the other person. Facts already submitted in evidence. It's like, your name is Amy. My name is Margaret. We host a podcast together. We've been hosting it together since 2016. It is about parenting. It is called this. Like, we don't have to, how far into the facts can we get before we have something we disagree about? 
Okay. Yes, yes, yes. I, I get it. I think that is starting to emerge as my theme for the year. That, Let's like, not and revisit I say it, everything we know, we both know to be true. We don't have to rehash. Let's start with facts already submitted in evidence. Uh-huh. We understand these things to be true because I think that with politics and family and conflict, that sometimes we're so busy fighting at the margins that it's like we have this huge pool of facts that we actually agree on. And I think that might be my phrase for the year. That's okay. Emerging. I like not, it. I'm not willing today to commit to it, but it's it's burbling up. Uh, this next one I had never heard of before. I'm going to suspect that Chesterton's fence is also new to you. <laughs> <laughs> I do not know of the Chesterton fence. G.K. Chesterton was a 19th century oh. fellow who gave a speech and he told a story. And the moral of the story was you should not remove a fence until you understand why somebody else put it up there in the first place. So smart. I have so many examples of this. Yes. So don't change. So I'm going to put in other words. I guess this one's obvious, but you don't change something until you understand why it's there, because what already exists that you don't understand might still serve some purpose that is not obvious to you yet. But if you remove it, it might be very obvious. I just mm-hmm. heard, I was just in Banff National Park in Canada. And this Lucky. was like, That's I have a my literal, dream destination. It was incredible. Definitely, uh, I would recommend Banff to one and all when your kids are like old enough to go like hike around and look at pretty lakes and think that that's a, a good day. Um, but we were told a story as we were driving along the highway in a van by this tour guide that they, uh, the roads that go through Banff National Park are, are dangerous and you know it's dangerous to the animals so the wildlife crosses the roads and people were hitting them at night and of course that's dangerous for people too so they put up big fences where um where where they so the animals couldn't cross the road well then all of a sudden um their migration patterns changed and like it wasn't working at all like they have to be able to get across the road so they said okay we know what we'll do because we can't let them cross the roads, so we're going to put in a tunnel. So they started putting tunnels under the roads. And then what mm-hmm. happened, the unforeseen circumstance was um, the wolf would just sure. wait, wait at the, at the end of the one end of the time. tunnel for the deer to He's come like, through. He's like, buffet service, here we right. go. Right. We can't let them cross the road. We're just going to create a tunnel. Oh, but the problem was when we, we didn't let them cross the road, then they were dying because they were not migrating in the tunnel. Like, there was there was a reason we needed to let people cross the let animals cross the road and some of them died. Now they have bridges, grass bridges. That's not Chesterton's fence, but but yeah, they they changed something. We'll fix this, and instead they just created a new problem. Um, this is so smart, and I'm going to tell you where it applies. Meeting your in laws and oh, starting to yes, deal with their family. Yes, yes, yes. yes. That mm-hmm. is a Chesterton's fence. Mm-hmm. So. I've told this story on the podcast before. I'm going to tell it very briefly. Glennon Doyle talks about this in one of her books that uh, I can't remember who the writer is, but possibly Maya Angelou talks about being somewhere and a rug gets rolled out and she notices that everybody moves to the side of the rug. And she's like, oh, these people, they rolled out this fancy rug and now everyone thinks they're, you know, not worthy of walking on this fancy rug, but I'm going to show them that we're all worthy. And she walks all over the rug. And then people are appalled. And it turns out that's where they were going to serve the food, which is why Mm -hmm. people weren't walking. And she uses it as a metaphor for entering her in-law's family. Yeah. You walk in and you're like, look at my dumb mother-in-law who still blah, 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 who runs things this way. And that there are in any family system there are a lot of fences and operating systems and ways of dealing that have been worked out over the course of 20, 30, 40, or 50 years of those people interacting with each other. And when your instinct is to go in and be like, these fences are dumb and I'm here to tear them down. It's not that it's not going to go well. And, yeah. and it's also kind of a rude and obnoxious assumption to make. And I think that we've all done it and, you know, we've all felt that way of like, well, why would you do things this stupid way? And I have a cousin who's still, he's probably in his late 60s and talks about driving by his 
childhood home in the winter and being like, those idiots don't know where the Christmas tree goes. Like, that's not where it goes because <laughs> it's like someone else is living there. They don't have the Christmas tree in the right, right. window. And, it, and it, it's like, right, we we feel that we understand why everything is there. We understand why the construction is taking longer because we've filled in this story. Mm -hmm. This is such a good one. Chesterton's Fence. I'm going to put this on my um, list. Okay. Parkinson's Law. This is okay. one you've probably heard of. I, I want, do want to give a shout out to the naval historian C. Northcote Parkinson. Please do, Amy. came up with this in the 50s. He was also a mathematician. And he actually like brought receipts and did math. I didn't write down the equation here because I, I didn't, couldn't understand what it was saying anyway. But it proves mathematically that work expands to fill the time available for its completion. So if you have this a is data packing. pack, yeah, if you, yeah, oh. if you have a data pack, it'll take a day. If you have an hour to pack, it'll take an hour. Correct. I mean, this is the law of packing, we call mm -hmm. it, which is, <laughs> right, like if you oversleep and you have five minutes to pack, you're going to be packed. And then if you have six days to pack, you're also going to be packed. Yeah. And I mean, one could argue that you might be more likely to forget your toothbrush if you do it in an hour. But yes, uh, that's right. That like, And also, I think that this falls into the category of things are never done. And I remember at some point, uh, someone, it must have been my mother-in-law, was at, at our house and came up and said, the laundry's done. And I said, the secret to happiness is that the laundry's never done. There's no <laughs> such thing. Like. Right. Feeling that the laundry is done is only setting yourself up for the vast disappointment that someone right now is sweating into a pair of socks. Like the laundry is never done. Yes. And um, stop yes. me if I'm jumping ahead, but this can also be the law that I've talked about a lot uh, with, for my former like writing mentor. Perfect is the enemy of done. That, oh, like, I didn't put that on here, but yes, that's yeah. It kind of falls into this same category that. Being done is better than being perfect. Being packed is better than being packed perfectly. Well, I've used this. Have you ever tried the Pomodoro technique, which is a way to like get, get things done? You've you talked like about it. What is it, like 23 minutes or something? Yeah, it's called that. I mean, it's kind of a silly name, but the reason they call it that is I guess you can make a decent tomato sauce, a Pomodoro sauce in 25 minutes. So you set a timer for 25 minutes. I actually have two um, hourglasses, a big one and a little one. So the big one's 25 minutes and you turn it over like, I'm going to send those three emails that I've been putting off for two weeks. And you give yourself 25 minutes to do it. And it's remarkable what you can get done in 25 minutes when you only have 25 minutes to do it. So I don't do that every day, but when I really don't want to do something I really need to do, I, I gamify it. I make it like, how quickly can I do this? I only have this long to do this. And I, I have found it helps with kids, too, to give them five yeah. minutes to do something. Don't say, like, we're leaving in two hours. Did you pack yet? You need to say, we're leaving in five minutes, <laughs> even if you're lying, and get them to do it quickly. Well, I, I think this is also very, can be very useful around homework. We have a half an hour to do your math homework. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, it could become a lot of, like, uh, we were just doing it last night. Let me do one question and then pet the cat. And, like, and then yes. it, and it, it's like, if that's the way you want to approach it, it's fine, but if I'm helping you, we have 10 minutes or we have mm -hmm. half an hour to complete this because I actually don't want to spend 57 minutes of my Tuesday night doing eight geometry problems because we're petting the cat and we're getting a drink of water and mm -hmm. we have to go mm -hmm. to the bathroom. And so I have found the technique of what are your three subjects and we have this much time to do each of them. And so go use the bathroom, get a snack, get a glass of whatever you do. When we sit down, we're doing this in half an hour. Yeah, yeah. Because homework, the homework creep, I mean, there's too much homework. We've talked about it. Homework is a nightmare. But there's also the problem of homework will expand to fill the entire evening if you don't check it. That's right. That's right. I agree. All right, let's take All a right. break. We'll be back with even more ways to make better decisions. So next up is Hofstadter's Law. Okay. Uh, Douglas Hofstadter in 1979 noticed that everybody was predicting that computers playing chess were going to beat humans playing chess within like 18 months. When somebody taught a computer how to play chess, like, well, that's it. But then, it, then by 1981, it still hadn't happened. Humans were still beating computers. Uh, computers beat humans yeah, <laughs> playing chess. But at the time... He uh, so he came up with his law, which was things always take longer than you expect. 
even when you take into account Hofstadter's law. Very self-referential. So this give is kind of more, like... Give me more examples of this. Things always take longer than you think they're going to take. Um, so I guess if you think you'll finish your homework in an hour, it might take two hours. If you think the the new tunnel into downtown is going to be done in three years, it's going to take five. But right. things actually always take longer. Because yeah. people are taking bribes and are extremely <laughs> stupid. <laughs> right. Bad, no, bad of- people. Um, that yeah. So so despite your best estimates, I do find this. Um, I I don't know. I'm going to write somebody a birthday card, and I think that'll take me 30 seconds. Well, it takes you 10 minutes to go find the card, then go look up their address, then go find a stamp. Right? That things that things take longer. I I am too optimistic about what I can get done in a day. I list yeah. five things and I do two of them because things take longer than I thought they would. This is um a problem that my spouse has so badly. <laughs> I he will say to me. I'll say, well, we have to get these three things done over the weekend. And he's like, no problem. We'll do them on Saturday. And I'm like, great. So when you bend the space-time continuum and you are able to live in three alternate Marvel timelines, we will be able to get these things done. But uh, he, he just, and I don't know, he's an engineer. I don't know what the mindset is. This, this one doesn't light me up, but I, he has this insanely just the I, um, yes. inability to calculate how long things will take and that and i think it's a kind of optimism in in a lot of ways it can be a you know a good quality but it gets very frustrating when it's like we have to take three kids and and then by the way we're having people over at 5 30 and we have no food in the house mm-hmm. like at what point will that be ha- like the steps that it takes and we've talked about this with like marriage relations and and trying to say like Okay, taking the kid to the birthday party involves they need to be dressed for the birthday party. They need to have a swimsuit because it's a swimming party. They need to have a towel. That needs to be in a separate bag. Then they need clean underwear. Then they need a birthday present, a card. Then the present needs to be wrapped. That, like, breaking down the steps of things... Yes. Can be complicated for this people. Is, my spouse has the same issue. This is the, I'm just going to jump in the shower real quick. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. That if you're leaving at two, you can start to get ready at 157 by just jumping in the shower real quick. That's Hofstadter's law. Um, I uh, finally had to, this obeyed. may or may not be related, but I finally had to say to my husband when we're busy, like, you know, we had people over this weekend. It's like, we got to clean the whole house. We got to get, it was outside. You know, we haven't been outside in a while. We got to clean off all the chairs and furniture there's so much to do and then he like goes missing and i'm like where i finally said you have to text me i'm sorry you have to text me and say i'm going to the bathroom or like i'm going like you you just disappear that's like, a good one you must text you me. you have you this is missing exactly action. Margaret's the doorbell law. is ringing you <laughs> have to text me before you go to the bathroom i'm right. sorry our marriage has come down to this but like where have you disappeared to mm-hmm. for 25 minutes while I'm literally like holding a piece of furniture in the back waiting for you to take the other side? <laughs> and it's like, oh, I'm just going to do this thing real, real quick. quick. Nope. Nope. Been nope. there. Been there. Yeah. Um, this one is more, uh, this is useful for parents, I think. Um, Hawthorne effect. The Hawthorne effect. Okay. So. There is, it's named after uh, Hawthorne Works Electric Company in Hawthorne, Illinois. They were trying to run some um, productivity tests. What would make workers more productive? They were kind of dorking out, like, do we give them breaks every 60 minutes or every 90 minutes? Do we have it brightly lit or maybe a little more dimly lit? Do we, uh, you know, have things come from the left or the right? There were A, B testing, all kinds of things to see which one was better. And they couldn't get good data because everything was better. If they had breaks every 60 minutes or every 90 minutes, they were both the same better. And like the light in the dark was both the same better. They were totally confused until they realized that the variable was somebody standing there with a clipboard watching. Yes. This is Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Okay. Which is, I use this, exa- I talk about this all the time because I think it's so true. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is you cannot study something without changing it. Yes. That like the study of it. And I was recently involved in a project and people were making a documentary about the project that I was right. involved You're in. doing the project and then they're making a documentary about the project. I was while doing, the make, project, doing the project. Right, and people right. were making a documentary mm-hmm. about the project. And I was like, guys, it's Heisenberg all along. Mm-hmm. Like we can't, we will never, you, 
And I mean, documentary filmmakers are always like, we're a fly on the wall, pretend we're not here, blah, 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 blah. But when you have a camera pointed on you, you do not behave the same as when you don't have a camera pointed on you. It is impossible. And this is in science. Heisenberg is, is cited all the time because the act of like putting amoebas in a Petri dish and like changes their environment. So you don't really know what you're studying. Are you studying amoebas? Or are you studying amoebas that have been pulled out of their environment and put in a Petri dish? Uh-huh, and they might uh-huh. be very different things. And I think Hawthorne effect, right, is that things work, uh, people work harder when they know they're being watched, yes. right? Yes. Which maybe is the point of all those Facebook posts to be like, we're watching you construction workers. Yeah. And we want you to be faster. Accountability. But yeah, for sure that um, I have a really funny dynamic in my house where we have a sliding glass door that I can see from different areas of the house what's going on in that room because it reflects in the sliding glass door, oh. which my children have never figured out. <laughs> but it's I'm the eyes also, in the back of your head. It's true. And I've it's never told them door. and I never will. Okay, Hopefully they don't won't tell them you guys. this episode. Mm-hmm. But Yeah. So I'm often like, are you cleaning up in there? Yeah. Oh, really? Because I can see you're watching your phone. And they're like, (laughs) Like, how does she see me? They still don't. They have yet to figure out. But yeah, I mean, I I like the idea that there are eyes on you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is I I, I wanted to figure out how I could make this a useful uh, effect to know about. And yeah, it's the same thing. Gamify it. Right. If kids know you're watching them, they're going to work harder accountability partners. This is why I think I get more done at the library than I do in my house because you are with other people who are heads down and you want them to think you're also very working very hard and you get more done. I have found for myself over a long life of of um trying to exercise and having various levels of success with staying in, you know, what I would consider good shape and 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 at a top or even a mid, bottom mid peak of exercise, I am a person who has to work out with other people. I just, I think it all the time. I'll be halfway through like a really hard yoga class and I'm like, wow, if I was doing a tape, I would definitely stop. Like, but I would never walk out of a yoga class. And that's my uh, Hawthorne effect. And it works to my advantage. And, And I mean, we're in partnership. I've always worked with partners generally. I just... Left to my own devices, I, I need, I really do better with the Hawthorne effect. Well, it turns out it, humans do, so. Good. Well, it's I must be human It's universally applicable. Um, this one's a good one that I also hadn't heard of before. Gall's Law. Okay. Um, so John Gall, he was a pediatrician, uh, and he wrote in 1975 a book called Systematics that was about, like, the study of systems. So, I, I mean, smart person because wrote a book about systems and was a pediatrician. Anyway, Gall's law is a complex system that works is invariably found to have evolved from a simple system that worked. A complex system designed from scratch never works and can never be patched up to make it work. You have to start over again with a simple working system. Love this. This is so smart and good. Yeah. And... So true and so good for kids to think Mm -hmm. about. And I mean, my kids are still young and I mean, I entertain it because they're, um, you know, young and dreamy, which is great. But their plans, like their life plans tend to involve like I have a logo for my business. That's step one. Make a logo. Mm-hmm. It's like, wow, that's step nine million. Right. right. Like step right. one, what is your business? What are you making? <laughs> right. What is the uh, line of profitability? Where are you manufacturing your stuff? But they're just like, my logo slaps. And I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, I'm glad your logo slaps, but you have to build such a solid foundation. And this is right. The house building is a good metaphor for this, right? Like you build a giant mansion with a bad foundation, it's going to fall down. Like it doesn't matter how elaborate it is and fixing it, living in a house that was built poorly, fixing it is basically impossible. Like trying, I always tell people who come to our house to work on it, you can skip the whole monologue. 
please, about how badly this was done, how it can never be. Like, I get it. It's a it's a nightmare in here. But I don't need to hear the monologue for the 900th time of why would anyone do it this way? Because the person who built my house didn't do a great Started job. Started complicated instead of simple. Yeah. And so we're constantly patching it, but it's never going to be good. This is, uh, I think, why so many times systems that we set out to create for ourselves and our kids can can fall by the wayside almost immediately. Like I'm thinking of like, I have a kid with ADHD and, and when that child was younger, I would approach with systems that were, you know, color coded and large and, and exciting to me and completely overwhelming and didn't work for the first 10 minutes. And so you drop them when really what would have worked is a simpler system, like, like whiteboard. Like I, I, I thought about your example of writing, just scrolling on a whiteboard, what's for dinner. You didn't spend $200 on, on meal planner cards and things. And if you did, they'd be, you know, in a decorative basket, right? But the whiteboard where you just scribble Monday lasagna, Tuesday pizza is maybe a good place to start. It's a good, simple plan. Yeah. And I think that this is a good thing to keep in mind when stuff is not working. That like This is a great law to keep in mind mm -hmm. when stuff is not working. That like, what is the foundation of whatever this system is? Because I think we have a tendency to want to be like, I'm going to add another staircase. No, I'm going to prop this up. No, mm -hmm. I'm going to this. And that taking a hard look at whatever system is not working and going all the way back to foundations. And I also have made the argument that sometimes this is not possible. Sometimes in our interpersonal relationships, if you've known someone a long time and you've figured out systems that work that are kind of like crazy matchstick towers into the sky that are like rumbly and rickety, but like <laughs> you're standing on them, that you may not be able as a middle-aged person to dismantle that system and start again with that person. Like sometimes you just are like, we are on our own little rickety platforms and this is how we're going to have to relate to each other and we're going to just try to have to not upset these rickety platforms right because you can't tear down every system and be like it didn't start from a good place you I know if you're back at chesterton's fence here this yeah, house is way too we, complicated right and, and like we got a fit but it's it's there for a reason that's right, right. and if right. you it come started into my reason, house right. and you're like look at this dumb pole let me pull yeah. it down guess what Right. You're going to be killed in the avalanche of stuff falling on you. Right, right. But when it's like not a house you're living in, but I don't know, a, um, it's a spreadsheet. We run, we run our business, you and I, on spreadsheets, and we tend yes. to add more columns, more columns. When it's sub-spreadsheet, maybe at some point it's like, what was this really tracking in the first place? And you can kind of well, start we've over had with a that I can't think of how many times we've had that conversation where we say we're tracking this in six places or yeah. these are redundant spreadsheets. and Okay, like, let's go back and simplify, simplify, mm -hmm. simplify. Mm -hmm. Amy, I don't ask for, I demand a part two of oh, this because yes. this was so exciting. We have bunches that we didn't get to, including lots of biases that are fantastic. Yes. That, like making a decision based on a bias that you may not realize is there. And so I'm going to invite our audience to come to our What Fresh Hell Facebook page, which is at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash what fresh hell cast and tell us if they know of any good rules laws yes. razors or biases and uh we will look them up and do a part two of this because this was such a fun episode i could talk about this all day i love this stuff too and this includes ones that you have made up like Mar what was margaret's law i forget what it was oh you I, just I, know, you I have to text literally, me <laughs> yeah you have to text me before you go to the bathroom yeah, yeah. maybe a little more specifically applicable but it's a that, great yeah. law i'm gonna live by it anyway live by it. And with that, friends, we will talk to you next time. Thanks so much for listening. So long.